Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, dear guest, uh, uh, dear uh, Excellency Fahir uh, Parzade, uh, he is the ambassador of the Azerbaijan Republic to London. Uh, this is our tenth uh, session of uh, Young Scholar Seminar Series, which started uh, last year January. And we we are happy to see a young uh, talented uh, scholars in our institution. And uh, uh, Turan Gafal is one of them, and he will uh, talk uh, tonight about uh, uh, the Battle of Baku in the uh, 100th century anniversary of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And uh, he is uh, a main candidate uh, at UCL and uh, studying uh, School of History. Uh, before that, uh, his dissertation will focus the part of the Turkey in between 1996-2016 in the general context of national-state relations with globalization. He is a graduate of the BA History of Politics degree with honors at the Queen Mary University of London, where he specializes on Russian civil war uh, and its effects on Transcaucasia. The dissertation title was The Allied Loss of Baku in 1918. The question of responsibility was written as a part of the Bakunov's degree and dedicated to the founders of Azerbaijan. And Turan has various internship and research experiences in the international governmental organization, such as the Council of Europe, the Turkey Council, and the House of Lords, and the United Nations Office in Geneva. So, uh, please welcome to our speaker and have a good speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if this is working. Or can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much, first of all, Sabah Timbe, for all his work with me during the planning of this seminar, and obviously, dear head, Mehmet Bey, for hosting this wonderful event. Thank you very much. Dear Ambassador for coming as well and dear friends and dear guests. So obviously my interest to the area is not uh, particularly foreign to me as I am Azerbaijani. So this event uh, was kind of product of my bachelor's thesis which was about specifically uh, made on uh, the allied side view of the loss of Baku, Battle of Baku, because I also thought in my bachelor's that we know from our side what we did with Turkish army, but do we know British sources what tells us the other side of the story? So I was focused on that. I researched it. Uh, my supervisor was Dr. Jonathan Smell of Queen of Queen Mary University of London, and he was particularly one of the kind of leading professors in the Russian <coughs> revolution history. Uh, so. Uh, what we're going to do tonight uh, will be set in the context, obviously. So, as you can see, it will be brief background to the main events, uh, maps, photos, and battle plans. By the way, there will be some <coughs> pictures that will be shown first time in London, especially <coughs> that uh, pictures were, was one of our researches private collection, and there will be some pictures that I personally did last year from the archives as well from both Royal Asian Society's archives and the uh, National Archives in the Kew Gardens, London. And there will be a talk about Baku Commune, uh, as is like brief, brief introduction, Ottoman and the British involvement to the issue, declaration of the first parliamentary republic of the Muslim East, obviously it's Azerbaijan, and the Battle of Baku itself, and uh, its aftermath and future, what it gives us as a vision in, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the issue and generally proclamation of the Azerbaijan itself. So the region, obviously, what we understand when we say Transcaucasia, it's this bit of the world. It's very middle of everything. Uh, huge neighbors, huge history, huge trade routes, everything particularly passed through this region. All the religions have been lived and still people are practicing in that region. Uh, cities, major cities, port cities, I mean every kind of involvement was possible in this region and it happened through the history. So Transcaucasia, which is mainly today, is three republics, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia, and that time it was main hub for uh, oil pumps, which went to Russia and obviously sold to Europe by the 
rich kind of uh, investors to Baku as Rothschilds or Nobel brothers or Rockefellers. So as many people say actually, like Standard Oil's foundation was in Baku originally. And the toll came from Baku, then moved to obviously Texas and started modern age of oil pumping. As we see the region, now we need to see kind of brief background to the issue. As we discussed 100 years ago, we need to understand what brought us to 1918 particularly. Because 1917 was a major thing as we last year commemorated the 100th anniversary of Russian Revolution, especially the February Revolution, which uh, was particularly important to us going to uh, 1918 because it was a uh, bourgeois revolution, basically not as uh, Bolsheviks, not as proclamation, not as uh, offensive to other minorities. Actually, who was leading the provisional government of February Revolution was intended to give uh, autonomy to the minorities, such as Azerbaijan as well. So therefore, uh, just after the revolution, just after the Tsar's uh, fall, 9th March 1917, Special Transcaucasian Committee founded, which was very first in the history because till then, actually, uh, Russians just ruled it by the gubernias. They were divided. So first time ever Transcaucasia as a region came together and founded at least one voice to uh, tell something to the world, actually. So both leading parties in Petersburg, cadets, and Russell Zade, who was the national leader and the kind of one of the famous figures of the Musavat party, which was Azerbaijan's leading bourgeois party at that time, right-wing party. So uh, obviously they were thinking about autonomy at that time. No one thought about directly like involvement as independence after such kind of major, uh, huge kind of central power as Russia dividing the central powers and going direct to independence wasn't the thinking, was the first thinking at least. No one had predicted actually collapse of the Russian Empire. They were thinking that it will continue, but in other form of government. So, when we came to November 1917, obviously something else happened. And that provisional government also fell. And this time it fell to the Bolsheviks, which created a civil war in the country. And they were kind of strong position inside Russians as well. So Russia was dealing with its own issue and it was kind of one time chance in a century for minorities to create their own independence kind of vision because Russians were dealing with their own issues. So first government of independent Transcaucasia created in Tbilisi, now in the capital of Georgia, and named the Transcaucasian Commissariat and they declared themselves different than Bolshevik seizure in St. Petersburg. Well, when it came to, obviously, the beginning of the march, uh, as the Russian authority was weakened in the region, uh, Ottoman involvement increased, because Ottomans has lost many of their power in the Middle East, and they were struggling with dealing with the British forces. Therefore, they needed uh, some kind of proclamation back from the Russia, so the eastern kind of Anatolian lands, and obviously, if possible, Transcaucasia itself. So uh, the Grand Vizier, which was uh, equal to the Prime Minister, obviously, uh, Talat Pasha, signed the Treaty of Presnitos with the Russian uh, Soviets itself. So therefore, three major cities, Batum, Kars, and Ardahan, which not major because of its kind of bigness or like its kind of population, mainly it's very important for its railroad, because from Kars, all the railroads are opening to the Transcaucasia, going to Tbilisi, obviously from Tbilisi you can go to Baku. As nowadays, we are like, uh, the three governments again built that historical railway being a fast train going from Baku to Tbilisi to Kars. So, they proclaimed that back, and between 14th March and April 1918, few wars uh, occurred in between uh, the borders, and obviously, uh, Trabzon Peace Conference started. So Trabzon Peace Conference about, was about like uh, actually demands of Ottoman government uh, from Transcaucasia, which was whole Transcaucasia itself, basically. <coughs> and uh, that claims were rejected a few times, but three important developments happened that time. So these developments were leading actually 
step by step to Baku. Uh, at that time, I believe no one actually thought about that. But now, as we see the research about it, we see that they are taking us to Baku. So April 5th, the same delegation who was part of the Trans-Caucasian Parliament's delegation to Trump, uh, who was led by Chen Kelly, which was Georgia, agreed to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and he agreed to give, obviously, Kars and Ardahan. And same was not only Georgians. It was included Azerbaijanis Armenians as well, which was Armenians strongly opposed to give Kars and Ardahan. As they saw as their core, kind of. So, basically, instead of being bound by the brest because they thought that Transcaucasia now is independent, and brest signed by Petersburg, and we don't care about Russia anymore, so we need to go on our own, so we don't actually agree with the brest That was their kind of approach, same. And they declared independence. From first time in kind of history, Transcaucasia became a federative republic, and 22nd of April, and it didn't last long, obviously. Uh, and the state of war occurred, because as the Ottomans couldn't gain their lands in the table, they forced with the military power through the Transcaucasia, as they now proclaim as a completely other state. So it was good for Ottomans as well, because by attacking independent Transcaucasia Republic, they weren't attacking to Russia itself. So it was kind of win-win, but kind of lose for Transcaucasia, because it wasn't obviously equal measures as militarily with the Ottoman Empire. And without any kind of resistance, actually, the Ottoman Third Army took Erzurum and Kars, were continuing towards nowadays Armenia, and uh, obviously it was kind of big failure for Transcaucasia. So this is kind of British Atlas, what I found, uh, which pressed in Edinburgh in 1882, which shows, like, actually, approximately 30 years ago about our talking events. You can see here Transcaucasia. So how it divided was, and how they found a kind of state form. It was all gubernias, even Azerbaijan is separated there, and there is no Armenia, as you can see. It's Yerevan governorate, Kars there as well, obviously, and the Georgias. And Georgias, other parts are separated from Georgia as well. Nowadays it's Georgia, obviously. So from this mess, they found it, obviously, if I can just. <coughs> yes, from that mess, they found it this mess. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when you see, actually, the difference between that map and this map is only Russians do not exist in this map. That's the difference. I mean, as a like strong force, as a like kind of defender of Transcaucasia against the Ottomans, as the Russians proclaim, obviously. So what you see here is like general kind of all the events that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this was a very good map, actually not on from encyclopedias or anything, basic Wikipedia actually. So one of the contributors made a great map, which shows all the proclamations, all the cores, and all the kind of. Uh, military offensives and defensives in the map. So what you can see here is like massive Turkish offense through the Transcaucasia, obviously as a last kind of, uh, one before the last kind of uh, target is Baku. From Baku, they obviously went to the north. But as you can see here, they didn't only go from here. Obviously they went from the Iran, which is very interesting. Because at that time, Iran was hosting already two big forces. Russian army was there, and obviously the British army was there. So. Going from Iran, actually, Turkish army blocked British to move troops from their Middle Eastern forces and come to Baku directly from Iran line. They actually blocked it, Turkish. So, and plus there is another issue as well in this map, which brought us uh, to Azerbaijan's fate as well, and I will talk it later, and this is very important as well. So, importance of Baku. Why Baku? I mean, there were like kind of, Baku was not a major city at that time. I mean, the major governmental city was Tbilisi. And no one actually cared about Tbilisi, capturing Tbilisi. And obviously Georgians uh, made its own capital, and those other federative kind of two months living republics also declared Tbilisi as the capital. 
and first Azerbaijan's independence declared in Tbilisi as well. But Baku, why Baku? Because Baku was kind of booming city, oil and uh, foreign investments, not just on oil, obviously, on any kind of thing you can imagine, grain, uh, wood, uh, fish, caviar, gold, everything from Baku was exported to Europe. So, and this is very openly shown in the middle of 19th century, Baku was only 3,000 people living in Baku. And by the beginning of 20th century, it was almost 30 times bigger population living in Baku. So this shows actually how big importance Baku was. So Caspian naval fleet of Russia was in Baku. And this is not just important for the trade, obviously. Caspian naval fleet was so big that you could have put at least 30,000 troops and can, you can go to India from the, through the Central Asia. So what British told that more important than oil, if Turkish army captures Baku, they will gain the access to British kind of Russian ships, Russian naval fleet, and they will go to India from there. So, and it was the intention of Turks as well. And, and Germans were fearing from that as well. Germans, even though they were allied with Turks, they had massive, massive differences on Transcaucasian policy. I will talk about that as well. And hostility and tensions between locals. Obviously, as I talked about three kind of major kind of populations, Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, they were living together in Baku. Jews as well, Iranians, many of them working in like kind of as they call like uh, black work, what was like in the oil sector, uh, many of them. But the Russian commander Boron Sotashko, which is like very famous because of his Transcaucasian kind of adventures, uh, he wrote in his Zapiska, which was memoirs, in 1907, that when kind of Armenians started this kind of ethnic tensions in Transcaucasia, they knew it, they didn't intervene, and it was on purpose. That's what he said. And it was a commander general, which was like gubernator, which was head kind of vice royalty at that time of Transcaucasia. But obviously tensions were vice versa. It wasn't just Armenians. Everyone was attacking each other. So it's a fabulous photo from Baku, 100 years ago. I found it myself. It's in Duster Post Collection in Royal Asian Society. You can see, obviously, a guy in front with other guys who is from Caspian Naval Fleet, as we talked about it. And fascinating place, Naval Base is kind of close to kind of Maiden Tower, you can see there, and kind of central Baku, really. So it's taken by British. It was Delta City, as you can see, the, from the buildings. I mean, it's not like Tbilisi at that time. So it's a Baku kind of by British as well, sketch map uh, from the plane, I believe. And uh, as you can see, the Baku mainly is just this bit. But why is this? So this is the oil fields. This is everyone coming for. This is actually kind of just city center. And this place were ready to be burned in any kind of occasion. If someone captures it, they had like kind of every kind of uh, amount of petrol in to burn the petrol reserves. So, if this exploded, Baku would have been under ashes, and I believe if all oil fields burned in the behaviors, Baku couldn't have stand at least for a year from the ashes. So, and this is the train lines, this is like kind of goes to both south and north, going to Tbilisi as well from here to Petrovsk, and then obviously Yelzevpol, as to call it the Kenja right now, and going to Tbilisi. So this is the Baku station, and this will be kind of what, what's, the, what's the date of it? It's a 24 8 18. yes 18 and just how many kind of 20 days later Baku will be in the hands of Turks so because Turks when attacked they didn't have planes but Baku had so that's it first. so coming to kind of politics of Baku what was B Baku about? I mean, Baku was never surrendered to Transcaucasian federative or any kind of parliamentary and any kind of regime. They were completely kind of island of their own, as kind of they call it like a communist island in between a bourgeois revolution. So it was always Baku governorate, as not just Baku, obviously, kind of all the area was resisting to any kind of developments in the area, but they had dual last year, what is called in Russian as a dual power. So Baku Commune, which was 
basically representatives of the workers of Baku. They elected their representatives. They were almost 200 people. And Baku Duma, which was led by Katar Khan Khoisky, who became the first prime minister of Azerbaijan later on. And Baku Duma was founded by all ethnicities. Almost everyone was there, from Jews, from Iranians, from Azerbaijanis, Armenians even were there, and Tashtak Sutin, as we know now. And uh, Russians as well, Russians who didn't agree with kind of Tsarist Russians were there as well. And it was kind of led by Patel a famous Azerbaijan lawyer. And it was in between March 1917 when the Tsar fell, and till the March days of 1918, which is very important, I will talk about it as well. So, actually, Rasul Zadev was not against the Baku Soviets. Rasul Zadev was kind of main figure of Musabat party, and he had such influence that with his kind of word, all Azerbaijanis could have gone to the streets at that time. And some historians underestimate actually his call, but we saw that in March days. And so he agreed with Baku commune. He said, okay, I mean, it's okay to be like represented representing actually the workers of Baku, the oil fields and everything. But when they started speaking about the Russian centralism, the Baku commune, Rasul Zadeh said stop. Because Russian centralism was against the Rasul Zadeh's first ideals of autonomy and second, the independence obviously. So at that point, they kind of became kind of enemies. And they started to see Rasul Zadeh as like kind of bourgeois kind of uh, spy or something like that. So, so, actually, uh, many people don't know as well because Baku commune was led by Stepan Shalmian, who was ethnic Armenian and uh, personal kind of linked with Stalin himself. And he was that time head of Baku commune. And many people think that he actually cooperated with Tashnaks, which was Armenian nationalist from the very beginning. It was wrong. Actually, they were against all kind of everyone. I mean, they saw just themselves right. Everyone else than Baku commune was kind of wrong, needed to be kind of exterminated in all cases, and that's excluded Tashnakutin and Musawat as well, which then Musawat and Tashnakutin, even though they had ethnic conflicts, they were politically allies because they were revolutionaries. And that will be changed as well when we come to March. March days. So as we commemorate it like March days uh, on March, obviously, as well, in Azerbaijan as well, because it's a very important date. What was it about? Many people just think that March days was just massacre, just came out nowhere, just people had like ethnic tensions all those years, they just bumped off, they just kind of flourished in one day, but it's impossible, why March? I mean, it was kind of, why? I mean, that question is very important, because Kind of, when the 10th day of Trabzon Peace Conference was going, uh, everyone's had intention, like, attention to that, and like, no one actually cared about like, Baku's daily life. And Baku was in the second place, because first they needed to solve like, entrance to Transcaucasia, later to talk about the fate of the Baku himself. So, General Talashinsky, who was... Actually, I need to tell that as well, because... Uh, I don't know if you know or not, but Muslims were prohibited to become soldiers in the Russian army. So regular kind of Azerbaijanis had no experience to hold or even rifle. So, uh, but Armenians, in contrast to that, obviously as they were Christians, they were on the Russian army and they had almost 100,000 soldiers in the Russian army and generals and everything. We had generals. We had uh, kind of generals who married to Russians or uh, had kind of any kind of Russian influence in their family. They were accepted to kind of highest military academies and they were finished there and they were kind of serving in the Russian army from long years. But we had General Talishinsky and his Savage Division. So Savage Division was kind of elite cavalry division who founded from Azerbaijanis and Dagestanis who fought in Austria as well. And then later on came to Transcaucasia, back to Transcaucasia. And when General Tarashinsky landed on Baku, uh, when he went out from the ship, Shaomian ordered him to arrest him. Because they feared that if the cavalry corps come to Baku, they will lose their authority. So that's why they arrested him, and then everything started. In his arrest, people just went on the streets, started to burn the kind of fleet as well, burning the buildings, and vice versa, killing started. Musawat said, stop, but... Uh, Xiaomian didn't stop. 
I mean, it, he was like who escalated the tensions. He continued to arrest, he continued to kind of punishments and everything. So, uh, interestingly, what the Dashnaks did, what the Armenian nationalists did in the beginning, they said like, we will not intervene at all. I mean, it's about like Baku Commune and your savage division. Why should we care about it? And Musabot and Azerbaijanis were okay with that. They said, okay, we will not intervene and we will solve this issue with Shamian himself. Later on, when the street kind of fights began, actually there were fights, there were like trenches in Baku as well. Like, in, they just dig trenches in a few hours. Actually, no one expected that. So, Baku was ready, actually. And uh, when everyone, just because they were Russians, and it says in British memoirs as well, they stood by Baku commune just because they are Russians. I mean, they, they were like, they were just killing in each other's steps in Parliament and everything, because they were liberals, like, SRs, Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, every kind of thing you can imagine. But when it came to Russian fate, they said, no, we are Russians, we need to be together. So Russians were together, then Dashnaks changed the, their position, they became with Baku commune, and they started the massacre as well. So which uh, changed the fate of the city, and it ended with like kind of uh, Musawat call, calling like this like as open hostility, which ended like all, all kind of relations between Dashnaks and Musawat. So, he was kind of hostile against ethnic war, but not a civil war, as they mentioned it. So, as you can see from the pictures, like, it's modern day Baku, when you go there, you can see actually a few of them. So, Azerbaijan Avenue, modern day, it was completely ruined. This is actually like shells, like they use shells in city, inside the city. That's basically like, there were civilians, I mean, civilians against civilians, they would use shells. I mean, uh, this is uh, also like massacred people, Azerbaijan, as you can see there. And Caspi newspaper was on that building. They burned it down. But later it's closed as well. And uh, all these pictures, by the way, from the state archive of Azerbaijan. Uh, New York Times wrote about that, about the massacre. Uh, a year later, when they summarized the issues, uh, they said like 12,000 Azerbaijanis by the Bolsheviks and Dashnaks, uh, they were killed. So. March Day is marked Independence Day. Actually, March, March Day is our Independence Day because at that time, Azerbaijan is finally decided that we cannot live no longer with Russians. It's impossible to even gain autonomy, so <coughs> independence is the only way. So, Russia is no longer an option, and Ottoman Empire, first time ever, they saw that as like only solution for Transcaucasia, Azerbaijan. And, Baku kind of people, Azerbaijanis, for majority, became minority because they mostly fled or killed during the uh, days. And political exile happened as well. Many politicians went to Tbilisi, later on proclaimed Azerbaijan's independence there. And very importantly, maybe the first time ever, Baku's oil nationalized. And uh, that's why like many of our own millionaires, rich people, who kind of resisted it, and then few arrested, and they were kind of called later on, because of the arrests. And 11th May 1918, Ottomans demanded further access to Transcaucasia, which was kind of accepted by Azerbaijanis, uh, but really kind of refused, obviously, by Georgians and Armenians. And uh, further conflicts escalating, like obviously Azerbaijanis now started gaining kind of Ottoman support, and Georgians, interestingly, went for Germans. Georgians choose Germans. Even they put German flag on their new money, interestingly, and they became German proctorate. So, and by 26 May, obviously, it's Georgia's national day, and Armenia and Azerbaijan later declared its independence 28th of May, which we will celebrate in a few days. And Azerbaijan declared the first capital as Genja, which was Yelizabeth Paul at that time. And Russell's had stated at that time that Genja is our temporary capital and the Baku is the ultimate goal we need to go there. So how? How you go there? I mean, you need to first declare obviously independence, isn't it? I mean, this is the original independence kind of document, which is now in National Museum of History of Azerbaijan which is very important because it marks like very first things in the history. Azerbaijan state is democratic public in the second point, it says. So, first time ever in Muslim is a country becomes parliamentary democratic public. And it's in the fourth 
it says like guarantees to all its citizens full civil and political rights regardless of ethnic, religion, class, profession or sex. So it's kind of, we didn't have suffragettes. We had rights right immediately. So that's like kind of first kind of giving rights to women to vote by this point. So all nationalities included and everything because very inclusive. So how, how kind of we wanted to capture Baku, that question. We obviously needed Ottoman support. So what happened is Turkish troops, and next slide is very kind of interesting, I find it. And Ottomans already were in Transcaucasia. They were kind of capturing the back, their own <coughs> cities, the eastern Anatolia, and they were moving into nowadays Armenia and Georgia. They were kind of, they were all, all everywhere, in Iran as well. But kind of how to go to Baku? Obviously the best way is go through kind of, as I said before, cars, railway, take cars, they took it, go to Tbilisi, then by railway to go to Baku, the fastest way. But obviously as the Georgians claimed the German support, Germans said no, you cannot go to Baku because we already have a deal. If Russians get Baku first, we'll get 25% of the Baku oil. So even though Germans and Ottomans were kind of allies in the war, they were, had completely different kind of views. And if you want to read more about this, you can use uh, Baghdad Berlin Railway. There's a very good book by German kind of historian tells about like Transcaucasia's kind of difference politics in between Germans and Turks. So this was problem. So Vehi Pasha couldn't go from Georgia. So what happened is Enver Pasha, who was de facto ruler of Ottoman Empire at that time, minister of war, and who was like general commander of armies uh, instead of Sultan himself. And he had a brother, he had a younger brother. They weren't kind of brother-brother, they were stepbrother. Nuri Pasha was stepbrother of Ember. And uh, kind of, and he, he is very young. He was very young, He's, uh, just, he was just lieutenant. And they increased his rank two times in one day, making him general in one day, just to put him the head of the army which will go to Baku. So he went to Mosul from Istanbul, which was the headquarters of Middle Eastern Ottoman army. And from Mosul, he went to Tabriz. Uh, from Tabriz, he went to Zengezur, which is nowadays in Armenia, but that time was majority Azerbaijanis. Uh, it's just between Nakhchivan and Karabakh, if you know the Azerbaijan's map. So that time it was completely like we didn't have that kind of blockade for Nakhchivan. And he enters Genja and he reads his brother's letter, Ember's letter, which says that we uh, came here not just to stay here, we'll go to true Caspian. The first time Turks using Transcaspian in, in this letter, Transcaspian term, because they had intention to go to Central Asia. So, and Genja was flourished. Genja had with flowers and flags, uh, which prepared in secrecy to, during the Russian times, they took out, they welcomed Turks, and it opened to public support to Turkish army. They didn't have any kind of problems, rather than kind of other ethnic minorities, obviously. But obviously, situation was not good. I mean, Ottoman Empire was already losing the war, and didn't, they didn't have like proper resources, and Azerbaijan didn't have proper kind of uh, army experience to go to Baku. And what he wrote, Nuri to Ember, uh, in Genja, by the end of February, obviously, situation is very dangerous. If they not capture the Baku, Baku will be lost forever. So, and there is a grain in Azerbaijan which can be exported, which was Ottoman Empire was needed immediately. Uh, and people are good with Turkish, what he said, looking forward to welcome. And Georgians celebrating the Turkish army's entrance with German flags. <laughs> it's kind of Georgians were living kind of another kind of dream at that time. And. Uh, the problem was there were more officers than soldiers, as I said before, because the soldiers, Azerbaijan never served in Russian army, they were only kind of officers. That's why we had more officers rather than soldiers. So, and this is obviously this Caucasus Islamic army, which they called, and it was interesting <coughs> not to call it Ottoman army, because Ottomans 
Istanbul officially told the world that Ottoman army doesn't exist in Turkey. So it's actually kind of local force. So it was very important to call it Caucasian Islamic Army. That's why its name is different. It's not like Ninth Ottoman Army anymore. This is a very important picture because it's first time ever shown in London, I can say, because it's from the collection of Dilga Mahmud, which is our very kind of young and brilliant kind of researcher in Istanbul. He personally buys these old photos and he bought this in one Istanbul shop, old Istanbul shop, and in his second book, it's a cover photo. Why this is important? Because Azerbaijan needed support, complete support, as like agreement between Ottomans and Azerbaijanis, because with that agreement, Ottomans would have agreed that Azerbaijan exists, and Azerbaijan would have proclaimed official support. So they went to Istanbul, this gentleman, as you see there, and uh, one of them is very important for me personally, I will tell you why. And standing you can see, uh, unfortunately this gentleman here is unknown, no one could find who he is, uh, but Mir Yusuf Bab Mir Babayev, Pepinov, and the rest of Ottoman delegation, these guys here, you can see German Cross, most probably he fought in Romania, and from front row, Aslan Bey, executive as well, Khalil Bey, Muhtar Bey, which was ambassador, uh, host of the delegation as well. And this is most probably, the place is uh, Babu Ali, most probably, the kind of uh, office of prime minister of Ottoman Empire. It's in Istanbul. Mohamed Emre Sozade, you see here, founders, one of the founders of Azerbaijan, head of delegation. And this is Colonel Abdul Hamid Bey, guy, the Russian military expert of the delegation, who is actually also my great grandfather. So uh, that's why <laughs> it's important photo for me. So, and he was uh, the last head of general staff of Azerbaijan's uh, First Republic, and he was just 36 when he was general and he was shot by Bolsheviks in 1920. Yeah, uh, because he supported revolt against Bolsheviks. So this is Abdul Hamid Bey, and I hope he's proud right now. And uh, by the British involved, so we talked about the Ottoman involvement, and uh, British involvement is important. I, I took it from uh, National Archives from Kew Gardens. They saw that Azerbaijanis get support from, obviously, Ottoman Empire, and Georgians now relying on Germans. Who can they use? The Armenians. To be successful in Transcaucasia and get the Baku oil in hand. And not to let Turks go to Central Asia to do their Turanian policy to kind of get all Turks together. Uh, so they didn't let kind of this chance to go and using Armenians was a kind of priority and this Eastern report to the Whitehall uh, by the end of 1970, it's not even 1918 that time. Dance the Falls, which was my kind of area, which I wrote my dissertation about in my bachelor's. It was kind of about the Dance the Falls and why they lost the Baku to uh, Ottoman forces. So, Dance Force. So, Dance Force, what was Dance Force was about? Dance Force was first special force in the history. So, completely made of offices, British offices, of all British army, from the Indian army to Canadian army, and Stratford regiments, and the royal kind of marines, and uh, military kind of uh, <coughs> Red Cross corps. Everyone was there, kind of mixture of British kind of soldiers, not soldiers, sorry, officers. Uh, and why Dunster Force? Obviously because this gentleman, General Dunster Will, which was very famous during that time in uh, British Army, Indian Army actually, not because of his success, but because of his uh, childhood friendship with Rudyard Kipling. Because as Kipling wrote uh, in his book, uh, Stolky, the character, was actually Dunster Will. So that's why he was very famous among the British soldiers, but he was very adventurous man. He loved to eat, drink, and just to do everything rather than being sort of actually general. So, uh, and he's, he wasn't capable, London knew that very well. And just because, I mean, he knew some kind of 
local languages, not even in, obviously Turkish, they sent him to Baku. And it was the first intention was not to go to Baku. And the first intention was to go to Tbilisi, as you can see, and change the fate of uh, Transcaucasia from there. But obviously he couldn't go as, sorry, as in the map I saw, I saw the like, um, Turks blocked Iran way, so he couldn't go to Tbilisi. So he, wait, he was waiting for almost a year to pass to Baku in Iran. He was just sitting there and watching roads. Well, in his diary, he writes that. I just watched the northern Persian roads. I, 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 I was Iranian police. So, uh, and why he couldn't go to Baku as well? Because Baku commune, who was in the power at the time, resisted to invite them. Like everyone in Baku was hoping and praying to British to come to defend the city against the Turks. But the Baku commune said no, because they had direct order from Stalin and Lenin saying like, no British, no imperialists will enter to Baku because that will be the end of our oil kind of pump. So, so it was like kind of strange case of Colonel Bichakarov, which they say like Bichakarov was kind of Russian officer, one of the very last kind of Russian regiments were going from Iran to kind of back to Russia, and so they were kind of uh, they said Baku commune that they are. Bolsheviks right now, so they can pass. So they went to Baku, proclaimed as Bolsheviks, they passed there, then they didn't defend the city, they changed the game, they went to Dagestan. So it was kind of treason to Baku as well. And Dr. Ar Aratian's Armenian doctor went three times to Iran to call Dunsterwil to Baku. And last time he went with his daughter and then Dunsterwil agreed. And uh, then kind of uh, regime change also happened in Baku, as like Baku commune fell, and uh, kind of Bolsheviks, when they fell down, they brought something new, Central Caspi dictatorship, and which invited British officials to Baku. And British mission was very small, just few armored corps and officers, and nothing that, because they were expecting at least 10,000 Armenians defending the city right now. So this is Duster will, Duster force actually. This is Armenians, so they were training, kind of. What he said when he came to Baku, like a British general on the Caspian, but sea unplowed before British kills, on the board a ship named after South African Dutch president, whom he enemy, sailing from a Persian port under the Serbian flag to relieve from the Turks a body of Armenians in revolutionary Russian town. So he had no idea where he's going. So. Uh, he arrived to Baku end of uh, mid mid August. There are memoirs. Memoirs, obviously, you can read. I will not read it for you. And the kind of ethnic tensions were still continuing in Baku. Uh, that's why, kind of, still, Azerbaijanis didn't help at all for any kind of Baku's defense against their own forces. Kind of. This is Brian Pierce wrote about, and this is kind of Captain Harrison from Canadian Army serving in Dunster Force. This is again General Dunsterville giving some medals or something to Armenian child soldier, I believe. And this is also Baku, Central Baku, which they trained Armenians. So, <laughs> what Armenians did instead of defending the city, they were going to Boulevard to hang out with their girlfriends in the middle of the war. And uh, kind of, they were taking their machine guns as well from the front. I mean, uh, five hour break basic for basic lunch, or like every, for every decision, they didn't obey to British soldiers. They were have like kind of revolutionary kind of groups. They need to decide, agree on the order. Like, that's why like, Dunster will actually hate it from whole Baku itself because of its revolutionary kind of sense and not obeying the orders at all. This is the game. Uh, what what Dunster will wrote about this picture, he said like, few Armenian soldiers and you can see a beautiful Armenian in the middle. So uh, Red Cross, you can see again Armenians, not trenches even, they didn't even dig trenches. Battle of Baku, so Battle of Baku happened actually very fast. In just August, it happened and finished. First attack was unsuccessful. Unfortunately, I couldn't find English maps, so it's in Russian, sorry for that. 
Well, I will translate it for you, kind of things for you. And this, these arrows are Turkish forces, and these arrows obviously defenses. And uh, first attack was failed, and this was kind of big fail. Many soldiers died. But the second attack, which was on 14th of uh, September at 2 a.m. in the morning, until actually night, but uh, and there were an Arab deserter from Ottoman army. He came to Dunsterville and personally told all the plans uh, of attack. Dunsterville didn't believe. Later on, when he saw kind of first kind of movement of attack, he believed him, but he was too late. So uh, the Allies couldn't resist actually because it was too fast that they started at night by kind of other night, but it was already hands of Turks. So on the 14th, when the Dunster will saw like there is no way to hold the city, he just took all his British kind of soldiers and officers. He just ran to the kind of Caspian shores, get on the sea, and went from Baku, but just like that. I mean, it was unexpected even for kind of locals like Armenians and Russians who were defending the city, and they started to open fire not to the Turks, but the Dunsterville to, to get him back. But no shell hit like Dunsterville's ship, and he went with kind of uh, some refugees to kind of Enzeli port of Iran. And when he arrived to Enzeli, he had already a letter waiting for him from London, which said, you're no longer commander anymore. Oh, it went. Hmm. Yeah, Nuri Pasha entered the city from the Wolf's Gate, uh, which was kind of secret code during the Soviet era. Many people doesn't know that as well, as they couldn't call it as a Turkish gate during the Soviet time. They called it Wolf's Gate, so as it came named today as the entrance of Turks to Baku. So this is a Turkish bombardment. You can see Turkish flag, and you can see the obviously Baku Bay here, and this is the famous British armored cars, armored cars defending the Baku. And this is a British funeral of the soldiers. You see, they were. It, it, it is like kind of some memoirs in Baku right now, in, the, in those places. And I will show you that. The problems of Baku was kind of water problem, whole the whole year, and the burning of the oil fields. And this is from the Cavendish Encyclopedia. Um, as you can see, civilians. These are from all Dunster Force Gallery in Royal Asian Society. And this is the refugees. When the Armenians saw first shells coming from Turks, they immediately ran to the ships. Even they kind of gave all their golds and diamonds just for kind of one place uh, to get into the ships to go to kind of Transcaspian or to Iran. So there were lots of people with less ships than the people, or some ships just refused to get of them because they knew that refugees actually carrying more gold, so they wanted all of it. That's why like many people actually died on the sea just by just jumping the ships. So this happened. And Baku becomes the capital. This is like official march of uh, Turkish soldiers in the middle of Baku. This is from Nuri Pasha's, I believe, personal gallery, which is now in uh, Istanbul military uh, museum. I saw that as well. Uh, this is Azerbaijan cavalry division, which was a division at that time, and then it's changed name, obviously, became Azerbaijan army. This, these all are Azerbaijan cavalry corps, first corps of Azerbaijan army, and it says like Turkish or the Subakida that is the Turkish army in Baku 1918 by the So, um, this is the memoirs, uh, as in Baku, when you go, you see Turkish kind of ally of martyrs in the very highest point of Baku, and this was, this is actually put in Baku after kind of several kind of British kind of call to put some memoir for Duster Force in Baku because I believe Haider Aliyev personally resisted because he said like there cannot be uh, any kind of memoir who fought alongside Armenians to defend Baku. But uh, after British said like kind of many times kind of uh, to put something like this, they put kind of this is a very small kind of next to this actually I believe. And uh, names who died in Baku, the British soldiers, Royal Marines, Royal Engineers, and yeah. Few pictures, very beautiful picture from uh, archives of Royal Society as well. 
1918 Baku and today how it is. So you can see actually the core is the same. But this picture as 100 years ago, Baku Bay. So <laughs> there's no more ships here. <laughs> I mean, lots of things changed. No more kind of oil reserves in the shore, at least in this side of the Caspian. Nothing like this. And this is Baku now. So as we talk about like anniversary, and this is like kind of achievement. Maybe the founding fathers of Azerbaijan didn't even dream in their best dreams that Azerbaijan can become this kind of... Uh, even Baku, I mean, Nuru Pasha, I don't think that he would have even dreamed that Baku would become like this. So, and this is very important that I just found last week, British Library's archives. It's very, very interesting. I don't think that anyone actually found it before me. And uh, because if they found it, they would have obviously changed many things. It would have been an article I searched it, I couldn't find. And this is basically a British letter <coughs> sent from London uh, to Baku. This is from spy reply to London. And it says, in 1920, when still Azerbaijan was existing in January, wasn't occupied by the Soviets in April, Azerbaijan was actually in secretly allied with Kemalist movement in Turkey. So, while the Kemal Atatürk was fighting against the British in Anatolia, he was actually in connection with Baku, which was independent at that time, and de facto recognized by Britain. And here it says, immediately say to the world that you are not aligned with Kemal Atatürk, all will not recognize you as de facto, as we do right now, by Her Majesty's government. So it's like ultimatum from Britain to Azerbaijan, saying like, deny it, please. So, this is very... And this is the obviously the last kind of slide shows Azerbaijan's map, who went, which went to Versailles conference in Paris, to the Paris Peace Conference, and demanded kind of acceptance from the world. Uh, unfortunately, it was limited to de facto recognitions from United States and Britain. Uh, but still, first time ever in the world, Azerbaijan was officially named a state. Not any gubernias, <laughs> Baku, Yuzabet Pol, nothing else, or Khanaids, small things, but Azerbaijan as a sole, independent, as a name, that time. So, yes, this was kind of a success story, as wasn't kind of dreamed at all 10 years maybe ago in 1980. So, yeah, I believe this was, was yeah, the last one. So, thank you. We have uh, some time for your questions and comments, so please raise your hand and then I can give the microphone if you have any questions. Yes. Firstly, thank you very much for an excellent speech. Well done. Um, what are the plans for celebration of the 100th anniversary in <laughs> two weeks hence? <laughs> well, our ambassador is here. I know. <laughs> That's the question. Well, <laughs> maybe he won't turn. Well, uh, if we can grab this, thank you. Well, thank you. Gracious. All right. What is the thing that uh, today's presentation was very, very interesting and uh, very unexpected in many aspects to myself? I wanted to congratulate Tural on that Thank one, you. his excellent research and um, dwelling deeper into many things that are unfamiliar, not just for myself, but for many people with whom I conversed on the first years, first year and a half of Azerbaijani statehood that was crushed so brutally. Um, indeed, we do plan to uh, pursue a series of events, and uh, they actually already started with a wonderful concert earlier this week followed by, to be followed, 24th uh, at 6.30 by National Day Reception at Jumeirah, to which all of you who have not received the invitation, which is possible as a case, because I do have a new assistant who has his own circle of friends uh, differing considerably from a broad circle of friends of a previous assistant. So all of you are invited, obviously, uh, 6.30, uh, we will not talk about some aspects of your presentation, <laughs> but believe me, some things I will mention in my <laughs> opening remarks. Plus, that will be, uh, of course, uh, followed by other... Oh, we, we actually... Another thing that we absolutely forgot was in the framework of the 100th anniversary of Azerbaijani statehood, 
We also sent out a wonderful delegation of Karabakh horses to the 75th Royal Window Show. Uh, it was, I think, as impressive as usual, and uh, we intend to do some more things, including a conference at some point in the fall, in autumn, uh, probably mid-October, uh, dedicated to the political realities existing in the region and the perspectives of uh, future political and security reunification in the South Caucasus, which probably is one of the more important things now, what was the change of government in uh, Armenia, and uh, just uh, commenced, recently commenced, presidential elections in Azerbaijan, plus uh, a certain degree of political turmoil in Georgia. <laughs> so we will see We will see where we are uh, by that time, and hopefully October will get us to a new uh, level of discussion about the future of the region. But any future is rooted in the past. For that, my thanks go to you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, please. Right. Again, Ron, thank you very much for this most interesting and very, very well uh, prepared talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, I know the, it sounded like a happy ending for the yeah. uh, Kafkas Islamic or, or army or the yeah. Caucasian army, but it wasn't all happy at, at the end, was it? Because the, eventually most of them ended up in Nargin Island and uh, become uh, uh, prisoners of war and uh, huge numbers died from starvation and, uh, and the sickness. Can you tell a little bit about uh, that sort of part because we want to know the post-liberation uh, uh, of the battle. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're asking specifically like the fate of the like heads of the Caucasus Islamic army, obviously there were like kind of higher ranking generals rather than Nur Pasha in the army, which was uh, Khalid Bey, who was the hero of Kutul Amara, who is very famous in the Ottoman Empire, who defended the city of Kut in Iraq against the British army and took actually General Ton's hand as a prisoner. So he was in Baku as well, and when uh, Ottoman Empire signed the treaty to end the war in 1918, <coughs> uh, he went back, he lived in Turkey, but Nuru Pasha uh, resigned from his position because British demanded him to go back to Turkey. He resigned. He said, I am now official, officially officer of Azerbaijani army. He served in Azerbaijani army till General Thompson arrived. And they forced him uh, and they said, otherwise we'll kill you, literally, to Nuru Pasha. And Nuru Pasha went back and founded first uh, small arms factory in Turkey. And later on, unfortunately, died. Uh, in expo exposed kind of, I can say, uh, based in 1920, secretly or not secretly, as my grand grandfather was secretly supporting from Baku, but who were actually in Ganja, who actually was resisting, revolting, and other kind of places in Nakhchivan, in Karabakh, and in Kuba, uh, they called together 16 generals and got uh, shot in one of the basements in Baku, which is unfortunately, and very unfortunately, is bar right now. And it would have been a memorial for those people who killed uh, 16 generals, Azerbaijan generals. And they were killed, they took, as you said, Nargin Island, and others were starting there as well. And Bolsheviks feared so much of the memory of those people, they put a stone on the bodies, dead bodies, and threw it to Caspian. So there is, there is no kind of grave, there is no kind of body. And personally, as my family kind of think, tradition, my grandmother's dad and his dad never ate fish from Caspian, just because of this event. Uh, yeah, just because great-grandfather lies on Caspian. So there is no kind of uh, a grace for them. I would love to see that bar to be transformed to memorial right now in Baku. It's in a very central place. It's called Prokhoryov's basement, which was a Bolshevik general who interrogated and shot them. So, yes, and later on uh, hundreds of German and Austrian and Ottoman poor prisoners died in Najin, and some of them escaped to Transcaucasia and went back from Kazakhstan back to 
kind of Europe and Turkey, some of them escaped, and what most of them obviously died unfortunately there. So it was very difficult. Yeah. I was wondering, like during this short period of independence, which institutions were established? I guess there was a bank, a national bank, and then <coughs> it, it, the, the, the bill has also the Bank of France. So I'm wondering who was supporting this currency. Uh, I don't know anything about it, but I came across these bills in, in Russia and I found that they're really beautiful. And yeah, just wondering, in addition of the uh, National Bank, I'm wondering uh, which <coughs> other institutions were created during this small uh, period. And also if you, if you could tell me something about the maybe the history about this currency and yeah, how it worked out. Thankfully, I know that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when uh, our delegation went to Paris, as you say, 1919, that's why first money comes out in 1919. Uh, before that, obviously, Russian old money used uh, in various kind of, from 1900s, first Nicholas period to Nicholas II, actually everything used. In and the temporary government. Yeah, temporary, money. temporary government, provisional like government. like a towel. Yes, <laughs> yes, big ones. Everything is literally used from Turkish money, from everything. A gold kind of Nicholas money as well. But first money, which is printed in France, that's true, and uh, printed when Ali Mardan Bey Topçubaşı, the head of the delegation to Paris conference, they went to, to there, and they obviously needed some kind of, uh, let's say, kind of, uh, proclamation to say Azerbaijan exists. So first was the flag, obviously our flag, that demanded to be changed from classic Ottoman flag to tricolor nowadays as we use it. We changed that and started using original Azerbaijan flag rather than Ottoman flag. And secondly, it was the money. So money was printed there and used obviously as in French, as in Russian and in Azerbaijan. So, but that money unfortunately couldn't be used very widely because uh, there wasn't enough in time. So uh, it was in official places, in Paris conference, they showed as examples of it. You can find it in Azerbaijan's National uh, History Museum as well. Uh, but rather than kind of establishments, if you ask institutions, first university of Azerbaijan, Baku State University, which was named uh, after Resul Zadeh for a time as well. So they founded that as well. They continued uh, girls' school, uh, so which opened in the early 20th century. Uh, later on, institutions obviously, uh, maybe we can say, like maybe the like kind of first fundaments of national kind of oil company of Azerbaijan, because as the Baku Commune kind of nationalized, they gave it back to conglomerates, uh, to capitalists, some of them. But still, Azerbaijan government held some shares in it, so we can say it can be degree of control. Yes, a degree of control. So, so it can be like kind of very first fundament of like national oil company of Azerbaijan, so far as we call it. So uh, rather than that, as institutions, uh, well, shipping company, as the Caspian fleet you now became like trade kind of merchant fleet, not the kind of naval fleet, became Azerbaijanis. Maybe that kind of uh, trade kind of, as we call it, Caspian kind of uh, shipment company now, Azerbaijan's, like founded that time as well. Uh, army, obviously, first Azerbaijani army, kind of there were no kind of soldiers trained, and they founded kind of first general kind of corpses as well, that's related to my great grandfather as well, he founded that. So, uh, kind of uh, first schools in kind of, rather than Baku, in other provinces, like general kind of uh, writing kind of movement, uh, acceptance of obviously Latin scripted writing, rather than kind of Arabic kind of writing. And for the first time in history of Azerbaijan, yes. setting out the goal of full literacy of population. Yes. Some people are mistakenly thinking that this happened during the first years of the Soviet war, it did not. It happened through this, uh, not full actually, 18 months of the First Republic. Plus, uh, the another, another question, I mean, the, the Rana obviously knows uh, everything, or almost everything, but the question that you asked with regard, sorry, thank you very much. The question that you asked with regard to the French writings, uh, the reasons were twofold. Obviously the conference of Versailles, yeah. plus the guarantor of the Central Bank of Azerbaijan was Credit Lyonnais. Yes, I didn't know that. Sorry, uh, another question? Yes? Thank you. Um, perhaps you can understand, uh, explain, one of you, <laughs> why were the French um, so involved? Because suddenly we have the French, uh, the um, Credit Lyonnais being the guarantors for the um, uh, Azerbaijani bank. But how, where, did that, where did that involvement come from? We didn't hear about the French, and suddenly there they are, playing this important role. Uh, 
Would you like to do that? You yeah, can. I, I can say that as well. Yeah, you can say it that. It will sound equally unpleasant from you or from me. No, no, you say <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, wh wh why do you think General Darcy will end there for, for the first time? The reason was very much the same. Everybody wanted a piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. It was exactly the same way the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, why did we invite... Uh, what was it, 13 countries represented yeah. by the national respective oil, oil companies yeah. after the collapse of the Soviet Union? For a single reason. The more countries have a vital interest in surviving of this tiny state in South Caucasus, the more chance it stands to be there in another 100 years. That's, that's the only reason. I mean, and the French obviously, having not possessed such a strong military presence in the region as, as the Brits, and uh, nor did they well uh, sort of political influence that. Uh, London had in this part of the world. Obviously tried to use other things, including the location or the venue for the conference, for the peace conference, which was Versailles, so obviously it's much easier to <coughs> involve your local bank then. It was very simple. The, the methods differed very much. French used the banks, Brits used the core, the expedition core, and uh, uh, political leverage. The Russians used brute force, very simple. There are kind of other kind of, as I fully agree with Sorry. Mr. Ambassador, and there is one core reason as well, because our kind of leaders back those times, they're mostly educated in Paris or in Istanbul. That is an interesting yeah. point. That's kind of uh, the kind of ideals of Azerbaijani kind of <coughs> Turkish nationalism, because no one called us Turks till that time. Tatars. Yeah, Tatars, as the Russians and European kind of main thing that called us Tatars. First, like, as our kind of first kind of student uh, population, which is very nice book will come out in next month about that, went to Paris, they studied there, and they got all these nationalistic republican ideas, liberal kind of nationalism, they uh, brought it back to Azerbaijan. They also arrived in Istanbul as well, where they got like, they mixed that liberal nationalism with Turkic ideals, and they brought it to Baku. So that was kind of our natural yet, organic bond. Yet at the very start, I'm sorry if I'm debating yeah. with you here, yet at the very start uh, of the uh, Versailles conference, uh, leading French newspapers came out with a series of articles that were partially dealing also with the region of South Caucasus, where they said that there are natural allies for Europe in the region, such as enlightened and humanistic Georgians. Yes. And then there are uh, more dubious questions like that of the Southern Caucasus Tatars. Mm -hmm. So, that much, I mean. I, again, I hate to be the devil's advocate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But no, no one actually wanted like to be present as militarily as British, because Azerbaijan, in a very kind of last chance, went to Italians as well, to get a, like, kind of, any kind of, uh, let's say, like, we, the yeah, yeah. last resort. Exactly, I mean, uh, to, to, to actually protect itself against the Moscow after General, General Thompson left. Azerbaijan in 19, uh, in 19, in the end of 19. So that's why, like, uh, and Italians couldn't come as well, obviously, as French refused in the first place as well, and uh, Americans as well, because the uh, British didn't want Americans to be in the region. So these all led Azerbaijan to be faced like a giant in the north alone. So that's why. What is interesting, of course, is that France played somewhat the same role for China at exactly the same time, a lot of Chinese intellectuals studying yes. in uh, France yes. and also working in the factories and uh, quite a lot of the later developments um, in the second half of the well, even more recent than that, um, developments in China uh, were the result of uh, the influence of people who had started in France um, in that period immediately around First World War. Many of them died in, died in France as well. I mean, many of them, like after the uh, obviously occupation of Bolsheviks, they, they flew all the world, like to Berlin, to Istanbul, to kind of uh, Paris as well. And many of them, you can find like graves in Paris, like famous of them, Topchebosch, mm -hmm. the most famous one, the head of the British. He's buried in Paris. So that we should do more work on France and mm -hmm. France's well, role. Yes. It's intellectual yes. Um, and political as well. Yes. Yeah. So, so kind of social. Uh, influence aspect ideologically, French Azerbaijan relations is important and also economic, obviously. Mm. But if we look at the kind of the way to the independence, the British involvement is occurring, yeah. kind of the most important way. Okay, my question will be the most unsophisticated one out of all the questions that we've heard. And, uh, 
Yes, please. Possibly we'll have the shortest answer. Uh, but I was wondering if there is any meaning behind the colors and the design of the new Azerbaijani flag that was uh, designed in 1919. Of course. I mean, do you know the answer or? I don't. Uh -huh. It's a genuine question. <laughs> no, I mean, like <laughs> some people, some people, because some people know it wrong. Because when I studied uh, in Turkey, in my high school, even in Turkey, many people don't, doesn't know what does it mean. Basically, what my kind of art teacher told me in Turkey does it representing the kind of uh, the kind of earth in the ground and uh, the soil and then kind of uh, the the space? I said no. So, I mean, it's not that simple. Uh, as because the blue color is representing the Turkic ideology, as Ahmed Aroğlu, who was the kind of, and Ali Bey Hussein Zadeh, who was the main ideology uh, like behind our flag, uh, the blue is a Turkic color, and the red, which was our flag completely red, uh, because of the Ottoman kind of uh, influence, that we changed it, it's standing from Ottomans as well, and also gives us the red of democracy and republican kind of ideals, of Europe as well, liberal nationalism. That's the point. So, and the uh, green, obviously, as like Islamic culture, where uh, Hussein Zadeh said, like, we will be European as dressed, but in the head Islam. Right? That's the kind of my literal kind of translation of the word. In Azerbaijan, it sounds more sophisticated, obviously. But <laughs> yeah, it was kind of. Thank yes. Well. Another question, comment? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the um, Battle of uh, Kudalamara, yes. and then the Nuri Pasha went to north toward Azerbaijan. Was it purely um, a reason to occupy Baku, or did they uh, got wind of British moving towards Baku, which was? Uh, I believe the kind of British involvement to Baku was kind of a detail of the Azerbaijan, like the, to, to march to Baku. Because when <coughs> Nuri entered to Baku, he telegraphed a uh, small telegraph that we go to Baku is a glorious day for our Sultanate to his brother Ember in Istanbul. What Ember replied to him is, "I congratulate your brother. You opened the door to Turan." So, I mean. It's just a doorstep. Okay. The ultimate goal was never Baku, was go to beyond. And that's why British feared that, not Ottomans, because they knew that Ottoman has no logistics to go to India, but Germans had. So they feared that if Germans agree Germans with Ottomans, they can go through Transcaspia to India. That was a fear. Uh, but obviously, Ottomans didn't have any intentions to India, but going to Central Asia was a better kind of chance. Go to Dragdad to Dagestan, obviously. Because that cost us, cost the Ottomans Baghdad. Yes. Because British then moved on yes. and occupied Baghdad. But another issue is Azerbaijan troops, like Ottoman troops in Azerbaijan, was not the best troops ever had. Actually, who fed and who dressed the Ottoman army in Azerbaijan was Azerbaijan local people. They had almost no logistics. What they brought only was like sh kind of mortars, shells, and the guns. Yeah, that's, that's it. No food, nothing. And that's why Nuri Pasha, in his telegram, first telegram from Azerbaijan, he says lots of grain here. So there is no... And military experience. Yes, so of course. Of course. <coughs> Old officers who trained the Azerbaijani army later on. Yeah. Thank you.